This week on Adventist News Network, livelihood training in Nepal. An Adventist filmmaker introduces his award-winning documentary. And progress on a modern Russian translation of the Bible. These stories and more, coming up. This is Adventist News Network, a service of the Seventh-day Adventist World Church. Thanks for joining us this week. First in the news, the Adventist Development and Relief Agency is debuting a program to teach sustainable agriculture to vulnerable communities in western Nepal. The three-year effort will target women, giving them the skills necessary to provide food for their families. ADRA officials say the program will eventually help lift the entire region out of poverty. They say the project will directly aid more than 2,000 women. About 40,000 people are expected to ultimately benefit from the program. Pastors in Norway are getting a crash course in reaching the country's growing postmodern community. Norway is one of Europe's most secular nations. Only 5% of its population attend church regularly. Yet, some church leaders believe postmoderns go largely unrecognized as a mission field in the region. Director for Postmodern Ministry for the Church in Europe, Miroslav Puich, says Adventists must learn to share the gospel effectively with this demographic. Puich and Evangelism Director for Europe, Janos Kovacs Bayro, recently met with Norwegian pastors to reimagine outreach in a postmodern culture. Kovacs Bayro reminded pastors that discipleship, not baptism, is the end goal of evangelism. The Adventist Church in the South Bahamas region realized a decades long dream with the launch of their first radio station. Word SBC 88.3 provides inspirational music and content to the island of Nassau. Church leaders say they hope to expand their programming soon by partnering with Life Talk Radio and 3ABN Radio Network. Young Adventists from across North America premiered their best work in film and video this month at the annual Sunscreen Film Festival. Held in Simi Valley in the U.S. state of California, the event provides filmmakers with the opportunity to show their work and receive peer feedback. The festival began in 2002 and has grown into a hub where Christian young adults can share their creative work, network with other media professionals, and learn from industry experts. Adventist Mission video producer Ricky Olivares won in the Best Documentary category for his film, The Golden Glove. This is a short documentary that I worked on my senior year at Southern Adventist University. I kind of stumbled into the story, but over time I developed relationships with the people I was working with. So here's a clip from the documentary, The Golden Glove. The biggest thing I like about boxing is you get to travel and see the world and meet different people. Yeah, that's, that's the best thing about it. And then you get to fight Russians and hear all the other people talk to you after the fight, like, men are good and stuff like that. It's, it's great. You know, I, I gotta tell you, I, probably more than anything, the reason why uh, I continue to do this on a daily basis is just to make a difference in somebody's life. This year, Southern Adventist University student Derek Taylor won the Best in Fest award for his drama, Comatose. The Audience Choice and Best Animation Awards went to Justin Burks, also a Southern Adventist University student, for his film Danger Planet. For a complete list of winners and more information about the festival, visit sunscreen.com. A modern Russian language translation of the Bible that began nearly a decade ago is finally nearing completion. The first five books of the Bible, as well as Psalms, the Book of Daniel, and the New Testament have already been completed. An international team of theologians and Russian language experts is currently translating the remaining ancient Greek and Hebrew manuscripts. Adventist theologian Michael Kulikov is overseeing the project from church-run Washington Adventist University in Tacoma Park in the U.S. state of Maryland. His father established the campus's Bible Translation Institute in 1992. Earlier today, I sat down with Michael to learn more about the project. Thanks for joining us, Michael. What inspired this Bible translation project? The latest translation was completed in 1876, so the language is outdated. 
and Russians have a great literary tradition, literary giants. They deserve a wonderful translation of the Bible. And the vision was my father's vision in the Stalin's labor camps. What feedback have you and the team received so far? Uh, leading scholars of the Russian Orthodox Church gave their high reviews. It was published by Bible Works. U version now is preparing to carry the translation, and uh, we are requested more and more copies. What does it mean to Russians to finally have an updated version of the Bible for them to read and study? Every new translation is a process of spiritual liberation for any nation, for any people. And in every age, new generation needs to read afresh the scriptures. And therefore, it's a preparation for a new spiritual rebirth of the nation. Thank you for being here, Michael. You can read more about the Russian Bible Translation Project at RussianBible.org. A movement toward daily scripture reading is underway. It's called Revived by His Word. The plan? To read one chapter of the Bible per day. The goal, to direct the attention of participants to the importance of knowing Jesus through His Word. Welcome back. Here's Lyle Caesar with the preview of this week's issue of Adventist Review. Let me tell you about how much a picture is worth. A thousand words, they say. Well, we're using that title to give you a glimpse on God's character. What kind of pictures are we showing you? Powerful pictures from over 3,000 years ago. Then there's a remarkable story of grace, Russian style, and powerful messages from the Titanic and Marcos Posegi's terrifying and bewilderingly amusing story, nothing to be afraid of. Besides, you can learn how someone suddenly became a champion runner in ninth grade, and it's almost two dozen of God's beauties we share with you this week, thanks to the camera lens that Larry Blackmer looks through. We want you looking through too, through Larry's lens and eye, and through the latest issue of the Adventist Review. Pick one up, if necessary, at the nearest Adventist Book Center. Better still, get your subscription. The Adventist Review, just right for you this week. Adventist Mission is making strides in sharing the church's message of hope. But Gary Krauss says a recent encounter with young Cambodians reminded him that the job isn't done. A few weeks ago I was in Cambodia in Southeast Asia and I started talking to two girls, teenagers, and I said, have you ever heard of Jesus? And they said, no. Now, I shouldn't have really been surprised because here we are in the heart of the 1040 window that stretches from Northwest Africa through the Middle East into Asia. 60% of the world's population live here. Most of the people are not Christian. I, I should have not been overly surprised, but somehow it hit me hard to talk to these girls. Never even heard of Jesus. And then last week I was talking with Pastor Willie Aronson. Pastor Aronson cares for global mission in Sweden. And he told me about a train trip he had had recently where a young 20-something woman sat beside him and he recognised the face from some magazine covers. She was a celebrity in Sweden. 
She blogs on things such as fashion and popular culture. She's in the media all the time and they got to talking. And she said, you know, I had heard that there were Christians in Sweden, but you're the first Christian I've ever met. Again, here we are in Europe, uh, this place that used to be the center of Christianity, never met a Christian. We still face a tremendous mission challenge around the world. And I want to thank you for your continuing prayers for mission, your continuing financial support for mission, and your personal involvement in the mission to tell people about Jesus Christ. Now let's turn to Megan Bronner for this week's Adventist social media highlights. Last week on a and Video, we featured a segment from Willie Oliver of Family Ministries about resolving conflicts in marriage. This week, we asked all of you on Twitter and Facebook to tell us how you handle contentious situations. On Twitter, Kay Rain says, I try to be as authentic as possible to abandon the usual subtle manipulations. Let your yes be yes and your no be no. Syme G says the best way to resolve a conflict is to lay it down at the feet of Jesus and pray for wisdom to respond in a Christ-like manner. Larita Elise says ask for someone else's opinion or counsel because they can be more objective. Festja MX says God gave us wisdom to use our skills like common sense and prayer to solve our problems. On Facebook, King says pray, find what God's word says about your conflict and then follow his leading. Mahasi says have the initiative to make up. Jojo recommends listening and trying to understand both sides, but says the most important thing to do is to pray for a clear and good decision. And Kim says, apologize, start over, listen, speak, and then compromise. Don't forget to check in with us this week on Facebook and Twitter to join our online discussions. Adventist scientists continue to find evidence of creation throughout nature. Timothy Standish says coal formation holds clues about the age of the Earth. All over the world, nature provides intriguing evidence that our Earth is younger than conventional geology suggests. Australia is no exception. In 1797, shipwrecked sailors discovered the first Australian coal at Coalcliffe, New South Wales. We know exactly when Western people found the coal. But different natural clocks give different times for its formation. The radiometric clock suggests this coal formed five million years before the overlying rock. Another clock, the rate of erosion, tells a different story. The flat interface between coal cliff coal and the rock above it indicates no erosion, so the coal wasn't left uncovered for millions of years. This flat gap with five million missing years, covers about a quarter of a million square kilometers. The Bible clock ticks far faster than the radiometric clock most geologists trust. But flat gaps also rapidly tick off geologic time. Recently, a group of Australian pastors went with me to visit Coalcliffe. Why? Because nature is wonderful and Everyone should be aware of the many ways it testifies consistently with the Creator's other book, the Bible. Still ahead on Adventist News Network, encouraging resilience in young people. Up next, this week's Tech Corner. As I was reading The Great Hope, this phrase caught my attention. And I read, the seal of God's law is found in the fourth commandment. This only of all the 10 brings to view both the name and the title of the lawgiver. It declares him to be the creator of the heavens and the earth and thus shows his claim to reverence and worship above all others. For me, as a true follower of Christ, the fourth commandment is a tribute to the creator who made this world and me. By worshiping the Creator God, I have the full assurance and hope that my present and future life is in great hands. Welcome back. 
For this week's Tech Corner, Andrew King shares tips for improving your video recording. Recording video has become easier than ever with the growing number of smartphones and the recording function of digital still cameras. Follow these basic tips to help your recordings look good. First, keep your lens clean. Finger marks and dust on the front of your camera can be distracting and sometimes blur your image. Second, keep your camera still while recording. What may seem like small movements while you're holding the camera will look much larger when you watch the video. Third, pay attention to the light. Lighting can be used to shape the emotion of the subject you're recording. When recording outside, it can be challenging during the middle of a sunny day because the primary source of light is directly above you. Cloudy days produce very even light and recording on clear evenings give you, gives you warm light. Fourth, give a sense of place. If you're recording at a school graduation, remember to get some video of the front of the school, the school buildings, and the families who are in the audience. This will really help put the graduation in context. And fifth, think about composition. Think about your subject, whatever that might be, a person, a car, a building, and move them slightly to the left, to the right, top or bottom. This is called the rule of thirds and can help you produce a balanced, dynamic image. If you record a video you think other viewers of this show would find interesting, please send it to us on our website, news.adventist.org iShare. For this week's health feature, Alan Handysides and Kathleen Kunteroff demonstrate one of the most important qualities young people can have. Handysides, what are you doing with that cork? Playing with this cork, but oh. it's actually a rubber cork. Oh. But I want you to watch it. When I drop it in the water, it doesn't sink. It keeps going to the surface. It keeps coming to the surface. Oh. You know, this cork is what I would call resilient. Yeah. Now, resilience is something that's very important in young people. Uh, yes, exactly. You run a program called Youth Alive. Yes, reduce at-risk behavior. You reduce at-risk at behavior, behavior by building resilience in the young people. That's right. And <laughs> young people get resilient when they have meaningful relationships. Yes, relationship with God and relationship with one another. And then tobacco. Will say you smoke? No. They say no. Mm. Alcohol. No, 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 I'm not going to take it. And you can push them down, but they'll always come to the top because yes. they have faith, hope, and belief. And that's what we need to build in our young people. Exactly. Resilience. So that like a cork, they'll always float to the top. They always reflect Christ's character. Because he's in them. Yes. <laughs> when we come back, this week's iShare report. And later in the program, advice for new parents. The Great Controversy means a lot because it's one of the, the books that I read for the first time when I just came to the church. This is a very important message for you. This is for this time. And this is something that we need to, uh, to learn, to read, because there is something special for you there. Every hour of every day, someone, somewhere, is praying for the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. Seven, seven, seven. Praying at 7 a.m. and 7 p.m., seven days a week. Welcome back. Here's Sergio Gonzalez with the news you reported this week. Welcome to iShare, where you bring us the news. Today we have a story from the Filipino capital Adventist Church in Washington, D.C. They recently answered First Lady Michelle Obama's Let's Move Faith and Communities video challenge. Let's take a look. The Filipino SDA Church is promoting a healthy living not only for the grown-ups, but most especially for the new generation of kids. We are communicating this healthy message not only them hearing it, but also putting it to practice so we make it fun and enjoyable for them. Therefore. This is not just a one-day affair, but an ongoing activities to promote a healthy lifestyle we all want to achieve for the whole family. 
Thanks for watching iShare, and don't forget to send us your stories at news.avenist.org slash iShare. This week, we're introducing a book review feature on a and Video. With a little help from his son, Tom Fraga reviews a book on raising children to become godly leaders. This is Thaddeus Arnold. We gave him a big, imposing name because we have high hopes for him. We want him to grow into a good man. More than that, we want him to grow into a godly leader who will guide and direct others in the Christian life. The book, Raise a Leader, God's Way, was written for parents who have the same desires we have. Prudence LaBeach Pollard draws on years of study to provide encouragement and biblical guidance on subjects such as parental responsibility, defining boundaries, genuine self-esteem, and character development. We all have ambitions for our children. Here's hope that you can raise a leader God's way. Raise a Leader God's Way is available through the Review and Herald Publishing Association. You can order a copy online at AdventistBookCenter.com. A new edition of Kids View magazine is coming in May. Kimberly Moran has the preview. Hi everyone! Did you know that Kids View is inserted into the Adventist Review magazine every month? We also send it to North American Division schools, and we have issues available online at www.kidsviewmag.org. Here's what you can look forward to in our May edition. Do you enjoy running races? What do they teach you about how you should live your life? We've got Heather Vanderhoven's story about that on our cover. In addition, students from Sawgrass Adventist School in Plantation, Florida, provided us with their picks for summer reading. Check out their personal favorites and maybe you'll decide to give one or two or all of them a try this summer. In this issue, we also give a shout out to all the amazing kids, more than 50, who answered our call to draw and write from our February calendar. Don't forget to check out our calendar, which is always full of interesting things to do and interesting dates to remember. This month, some of our favorite critters give us a fun look. For all of this and more, and to see previous issues, visit www.kidsviewmag.org. Now let's turn to David Trim for a look at Adventist history. This week, the birth of an influential missionary and theologian. Welcome to This Week in Adventist History. On April 23 in 1882, George D. Keogh, influential Adventist missionary, theologian and educator, was born in Govan, Scotland. Keogh later worked as a missionary across the Middle East for a total of 32 years in three different periods. He twice served on the faculty of Newbold College for a total of 20 years, beginning his second term of service which lasted 12 years in 1954 when he was aged 72. And he was one of the first teachers at the Seventh-day Adventist Theological Seminary from 1942 to 1946. In his time he had developed remarkably innovative, contextualized methods of mission, influencing leaders such as Neil C. Wilson. And he was one of the key influences on mid-20th century Adventist theology, mentoring scholars such as William Murdoch, Edward Heppenstall, W. L. Emerson, and Siegfried Horn. On April 25, in 1923, Minerva Jane Chapman died in Battle Creek, aged 93. The sister of J. N. Loughborough, in a remarkable career, Minerva Jane had served the church in a number of capacities. She'd worked for the Review and Herald Publishing Association for 26 years, serving as the press's secretary treasurer for nearly 20 years. And she was editor of Youth's Instructor magazine from 1883 to 1893, and most noticeably, she served as GC Treasurer, one of the executive officers of the General Conference, for six years from 1877 to 1883. She was a real pioneer. And those were some of the events of This Week in Adventist History. Thanks for watching Adventist News Network. Join us next week for more news from the headquarters of the Seventh day Adventist Church. And as always, you can visit news.adventist.org for daily news and videos. And if you haven't already, check out our new ANN video podcast. It's the same show you're watching now, but in a format that's compatible with your iPod or other portable media player. 
you can subscribe by searching for Adventist News Network Video Podcast in iTunes. Our good news for this week comes from Colossians chapter 3, beginning with verse 12. The passage reads, Therefore, as God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved, clothe yourselves with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. Bear with each other and forgive whatever grievances you may have against one another. Forgive as the Lord forgave you, and over all these virtues, put on love, which binds them all together in perfect unity. Until next week, God bless.